Auckland, New Zealand is the most populated city in the country. It's home to the tallest structure in the Southern Hemisphere, the Sky Tower measuring 328 meters, or 1,076 feet to the top of the radio antenna. The city has more than 50 volcanoes that have created the area's beautiful landscapes over thousands of years. Jesse Shane Kempson was an entitled young man who believed his desire for violence was more important than anything else. When that desire led to the death of a young woman, he shrugged it off and moved on to another woman the same day. This is Monsters. November 30th, 2018 was two days before Grace Mullane's 22nd birthday. She was in bed in a hostel in Auckland, chatting with a man she had met on a dating app called Tinder. Tinder describes itself as a place to meet your next best match, be it for dating or just to keep it casual. If you're not familiar with the specific app, it's the one where people swipe right if they're interested in the person they see on the screen. It's become synonymous with finding hookups and one-night stands. Grace had met a man named Jesse, and she chatted with him via text for about four hours before agreeing to meet for a drink the following day. The date was going to be at Sky City, which is an entertainment complex that has a casino, three hotels, a theater, and a number of bars and restaurants. The Sky Tower is also part of the facility, which is the tower that kind of looks like Seattle Space Needle, though it's much taller. It serves as a communications tower, but also has a cafe, an observation deck, and two restaurants. Grace waited by a Christmas tree that was set up near Sky City. She had taken a picture of the tree and sent it to her parents before she greeted Jesse as he approached. Both Jesse and Grace were relieved to see that the person they were meeting matched the pictures they had posted online. Catfishing, which is the act of posting a picture of someone else and pretending to be them online, had become an increasing problem when it came to online dating. Fortunately, both Jesse and Grace seemed to be telling the truth, at least about their appearances. They can be seen on surveillance walking into Sky City and walking through the complex into Andy's Burger Bar. This is a casual restaurant where they got to know each other, ate dinner, and had a few drinks. Sky City was an entertainment complex, specifically one with a casino, so it meant it had a very complete surveillance system. There weren't many places you weren't covered, and the cameras all recorded in 360 degrees, which is why, if you're watching this on YouTube, the surveillance specifically follows the couple. You might be wondering, how would someone know to keep the camera on them that night? Well, the camera recorded an entire 360 degrees, but then you use a special software to pick which angle in the footage displays in the video. It's pretty cool. Once finished at Andy's, they can be seen walking to a Mexican cafe where they had a few more drinks before moving once more to the Bluestone Room. The Bluestone Room was not in Sky City. It was a pub which was a great place for a casual chat to get to know each other. What Grace didn't know was that it was on the way to Jesse's apartment. Of course, he knew that, and he had that in mind when he suggested the place. Jesse and Grace shared their first kiss at the pub not long before leaving at about 9.40 p.m. They walked the short distance to Jesse's apartment at the City Life Hotel and could be seen on surveillance walking into the building and taking the elevator up to the third floor. This is the last time Grace is ever seen. Grace Mullane was born on December 2nd, 1996 in Wickford, Essex in the United Kingdom. She had recently graduated from the University of Lincoln with a bachelor's degree in advertising and marketing and took a year off to travel. First, she went to South America and spent six weeks traveling through Chile and Peru, places her mother had visited when she was young. Then Grace flew to Auckland, New Zealand on November 20th, 2018. From there, she went to Cape Ranga, the north tip of the Northern Island. In case you aren't a geography whiz, New Zealand is split between two main islands separated by the Cook Strait. The South Island has Christchurch as its biggest city, which is the second most populated city in the country. 
The North Island, where Grace was, has Auckland as their most populated city as well as their capital city of Wellington. Grace returned to Auckland on November 30th. She checked into the base backpacker hostel and got a bed in a four-person shared room. The hostel was right in the center of the city, the perfect spot to be able to explore the city, but it was something she didn't want to do alone. While in bed on the night of November 30th, she matched with Jesse on Tinder and made plans to go on a date with him the following day. Jesse Shane Kempson was born on December 28, 1991 in Lower Hutt and grew up in Wellington. His parents divorced when he was about three years old and he continued to live with his father. His mother took his brother and moved to Australia, leaving Jesse with his father who is said to have been abusive. When he was a teenager, he left home and moved to Sydney, Australia to reconcile with his mother, living there for quite a few years. It's reported that he actually got married and had a child, but they soon divorced and the child stayed with the mother. Jesse returned to Wellington and lived at a boarding house for a while, and it's also reported that he lived at his grandparents at some point, eventually relocating to Auckland. As a young adult, Jesse started living in a world of lies. He rented a place and told the landlord he was a professional softball player for the New Zealand Black Sox. He said his contract payment was on the way in order to get some slack from the landlord, but after two months of non-payment, the landlord contacted the Black Sox directly and learned that they had never heard of Jesse. At that point, Jesse bailed on the rental, never paying his debt. People who knew him said that Jesse would tell people his family were millionaires. He claimed that his parents owned a chain of restaurants in Australia. He said that he had a bachelor's degree in international law and that he knew people involved in law enforcement and immigration. In 2016, he met a woman on Tinder and the two eventually moved in together, with her paying for the place, of course. He eventually told this woman that he was a CIA agent and he had been ordered to kill her. The woman said he once held a knife to her throat and forced her to perform sexual acts on him. She filed a police report on January 19, 2017, saying that he had held her in a chokehold after chasing her around the house with a knife. She didn't end up pressing charges at the time, but she left him and got an order of protection against him. She would later go back and press charges and report the sexual assault. After that, Jesse lived with some female roommates for a while, but they all grew concerned about being alone with him. One roommate went to sleep with a knife on an evening when she went to bed and he was the only other resident home. He left that place and began renting a studio apartment in a downtown hotel. Though he told people he was a successful supermarket manager and restaurateur, he was actually paying his rent weekly with government assistance. He really worked at a telemarketing sales job, but was fired not long before meeting Grace online. He was caught writing fake invoices for orders and calling himself to claim sales to make his quota. On top of the lies, Jesse's violence increased and he tried to get women to participate in rough sex with him, but not many actually agreed. In the months prior to meeting Grace, Jesse had multiple dates with different women. One, he told that he was a cancer survivor, his parents were dead, his cousin was a famous rugby star, and that he was a successful businessman. None of those things were true, but how could she know that? On their first date, she said they had a great time that ended with sex at his apartment. Their second date, however, did not end how the woman had hoped. Once back at his apartment, he tried to initiate sex, but when the woman didn't respond, he pushed her onto the bed and began forcing her. Then he climbed on top of her and began choking her. This was not something they had discussed ahead of time. She was terrified as she fought to breathe. She started fighting against Jesse, but he wouldn't stop. Finally, she pretended to pass out. It was only when Jesse thought the woman was unconscious, or maybe even dead, that he removed his hands from her neck. As soon as he did, the woman sat up and pushed him off the bed. Of course, he responded to her anger with confusion. Surely she didn't think he was trying to kill her. He thought that's what she was into. Needless to say, there wasn't a third date. Jesse immediately began seeking out a date with another woman like it was an addiction. His teammates from his former softball team would say that his whole life revolved around meeting women. They even clarified that that was understandable for a young man, but said that his obsession was so bad that they were concerned about the women that he met. They went as far as warning women about him ahead of time. His landlord at the City Life Hotel said he actually asked Jesse to try to slow down as he brought so many different women into the building. 
so it wasn't a surprise that Jesse was back on Tinder quickly, where he first asked a woman he had already talked to on the service if she wanted to meet up for rough sex. She turned him down. He continued swiping and soon met Grace and the two set up a date for the next day. Grace's family hadn't heard from her since the night of December 1st. They had sent her birthday messages on the 2nd, but got no response. Grace had been in contact with her family every day of her trip, so it was weird to not hear from her, but it was alarming that she wouldn't respond to messages for her birthday. Grace had two brothers, Michael and Declan, and they had both been in constant communication with their sister while she was traveling. Michael contacted the hostel where she was staying and found out that after she left on December 1st, she had never returned, leaving her belongings there. On December 4th, he posted a message on Facebook that Grace had not returned to her hostel and the family was concerned. By December 5th, her parents, David and Jillian Mullane, contacted authorities in Auckland to report their daughter missing. Investigators in New Zealand began scouring CCTV footage, looking for any sign of the young woman. If they saw her on cameras, they might be able to trace her movements and find her. Fortunately, they were able to find Grace on surveillance footage that evening and were able to see that she was with a young man. They also found out that that same young man had commented on her Facebook page and on December 8th, police brought him in for an interview. During the interview, Jesse explained that he and Grace had gone out the evening of December 1st. He told the detective that he had met her on Tinder and they met outside the Sky City Complex where they ate at Andy's Burger Bar and then went to the Mexican Cafe before moving to the Bluestone Room. When they were finished there, Jesse claimed that they had left each other's company. He said that Grace gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek and they went their separate ways. He explained that he was hoping to see Grace again the next day, but when he went on Tinder, she had unmatched him. So he assumed that she only wanted it to be a one-time deal. The detective played along. He asked Jesse what he did for the rest of the night and Jesse explained that a colleague from work came over and he got so drunk he blacked out. The next thing he knew, he woke up in his apartment and it was 10 a.m. He went out for breakfast, and when he was asked what he had, he answered, medium-rare scotch filet with mushrooms, chips, and salad. That seems oddly specific for a breakfast that happened seven days earlier. You wouldn't just say, steak? Over-explaining is generally a sign that someone's lying. At any rate, Jesse said he then went back to his apartment, took a nap, and then had a different co-worker over. Jesse's an idiot. There are CCTV cameras everywhere. He looks directly at one in the elevator in the hotel where his apartment is. Every single move he makes is recorded on CCTV. The minute he steps into the elevator in his building, everywhere he goes outside and every business he enters, there couldn't be more footage of this jackass if he was famous and the paparazzi were following him, and the police had watched every minute of it. They watched the surveillance from the Bluestone room of him and Grace kissing. Then they watched them walk together to his apartment building, get in the elevator, and exit on floor three. Nobody else came in, and Grace never left. Jesse surely didn't get drunk with a colleague, and he absolutely did not sleep until 10 a.m. At exactly 8.01 a.m. on December 2nd, he stepped into the elevator on the third floor of the building, alone, and walked to a shopping center called the Warehouse Atrium where he purchased a large suitcase. He is seen on camera picking one out, going to the register, and paying for it. Then he returns to his apartment, again being recorded by CCTV cameras at 8.14 a.m. At 8.32 a.m., he went back out and walked to another shopping center called Countdown Metro, where he purchased cleaning supplies. Again, he was caught on CCTV cameras the entire time. He left his apartment again at 10.25 a.m. and took a taxi to an Apex car rental location. He is even on video in the taxi. Now you're probably thinking, surely there's no CCTV footage from the Apex. Damn straight there was. The Apex cameras were some of the best quality with HD crystal clear picture. From here, Jesse drove back to his apartment in a rented red 2016 Toyota Corolla hatchback. You know what they say, all work and no play makes Jesse a dull boy. He had the body of his last Tinder date still tucked away somewhere in his apartment and he was ready to hit the town again. He logged into the trusty dating app and connected with a new woman who quickly agreed to meet him. 
something that's easy to manage when you lie about literally everything. Jesse met the woman at a bar called Revelry, where they had a few drinks while Jesse boasted about his imaginary investment success. Then he began telling the woman a story about how his friend had asked his girlfriend to participate in rough sex with him, and she agreed. They were practicing strangulation play, and she ended up dying. He said that now his friend is in prison. I don't know if he thought this story would be a turn-on or what, but his date was now trying to find a way out of the situation she was finding herself in. Soon, Jesse asked her if she wanted to go to the Bluestone Room, of course, the bar right by his apartment. She agreed but said she would meet him there. Her car was a few blocks away and she wanted to drive it to move it closer to the Bluestone Room. Yeah, he never saw her again. After his failed date, Jesse eventually went to a shopping center and rented a carpet shampooer. He could be seen on surveillance, bringing the device out of the store and up into his apartment at about 8.30 p.m. Then he returned it about a half an hour later. Then, at 9.30 p.m., Jesse can be seen pushing one of the hotel's luggage carts into the elevator and it has two suitcases and a smaller bag on it. He's caught on surveillance pushing the cart out of the front doors where he's parked the rental car on the side of the road. He loads the luggage into the back of the car and returns the cart to the lobby. Then he parks the car in a nearby garage where he leaves it for the evening. The next morning, Jesse got up early and drove the rental car east. He drove to a Western ITM hardware store where he bought a shovel, and of course, the whole transaction is captured on high-quality surveillance cameras. He was back at his apartment by 9.30 a.m., and he was captured on CCTV, getting out of the car in the parking garage barefoot. At some point between the hardware store and being back home, Jesse had lost his shoes. He could be seen walking through the garage, then through the hotel lobby, and up the elevator, sans shoes. Over the rest of December 3rd, Jesse took out garbage, had some clothes dry cleaned, and washed the interior and exterior of the rental car before returning it. He really is a thorough guy. He just doesn't seem to realize that he's being recorded doing all of this. Once Jesse was done telling his bullshit version of events to the detective, he was read his rights. The detective told him that he knew he was lying and showed Jesse screenshots of him with the new suitcase. Jesse backpedaled a little bit, but finally took a deep breath and changed his story. Jesse told the detective that, after leaving the Bluestone room, he and Grace went back to his apartment where she begged him to participate in violent sex with her. He claimed that she wanted to have a Fifty Shades of Grey sex scene with him. He said she wanted to be tied up and held down, and when he didn't do it the right way, she demanded to be held down harder. After the sex, Jesse said he took a shower and when he was done, he went to sleep in an empty bed. He assumed that she had left on her own. When he woke up the next morning, he said that he found Grace lying on the floor with blood coming out of her nose. She was dead. This is where Jesse picked up the phone and started to call for an ambulance, but then had second thoughts. He knew that the cops would think he murdered her, so instead of reporting the crime, he decided to stuff her body into a suitcase and bury her in a secluded area, like most innocent people would do. This is Jesse explaining the process. Um, I went to the warehouse at the atrium. Um, and brought a suitcase. Um, I went back. And I was just in shock um, because it just didn't seem right. I left to go and get cleaning products. Um, so I messaged a friend and said, I'll meet you at Revelry. Um, after, after finishing drinks with, with her, I got back to um, city life. And all the time I just kept saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I went downstairs and I grabbed the, the porter thing. And I put the suitcase on top of the porter thing. I drove the hire car into Wilson's car park. So in the middle of supposedly freaking out about Grace being dead, 
He went out for drinks with a friend? Is he fucking high? He's like, oh no, Grace is dead. I need to get a suitcase and cleaning supplies and I should probably meet a friend for drinks. Then I need to cover up this death. Holy shit. The police didn't believe his story either and they would soon be proven correct. It was eventually revealed that after Jesse murdered Grace, he took explicit pictures of her dead body and then watched eight hardcore porn videos. Then, of course, he went on to Tinder to arrange another date. This proved that he had not discovered the body the following morning. He murdered Grace, took pictures of her knowing full well that she was dead, and then watched porn. Then, at about 1 a.m., he used his phone to search the internet for information about rigor mortis, the Watakari Ranges, and the hottest fire, possibly considering burning the body. This was not an accident that Jesse discovered the next day and then panicked. He knew exactly what he had done and enjoyed it enough to take pictures of his own work. Then he started to look up how to cover it up. Grace's body was located on December 9th, exactly where Jesse said it would be. Her body was stuffed into the suitcase, naked, in the fetal position. A medical examiner said she suffered from at least nine bruises that happened around the time of death. They were on her upper arms, left clavicle, and collarbone. She also had bruises on the front and back of her left shoulder, all injuries from being held down and choked. The medical examiner determined that the bruising on the neck would have been caused by significant force that would only be used to cause death. The strangulation was violent enough to burst blood vessels in Grace's face and left eye, as well as causing her nose to bleed. The medical examiner said he had never seen a strangulation case with such severe bruising. Despite admitting to killing Grace, Jesse pleaded not guilty and his defense went with the very unfortunate decision of blaming Grace for her own death. This became known as the Fifty Shades of Grey defense. Then there was the evidence, the surveillance video that contradicted Jesse's story, the pictures and internet searches that contradicted his story, plus three witnesses that took the stand and had all spent the night with Jesse, describing his preference for bondage and choking. This was not intended to shame his interest in bondage, but to show that it was not something suggested by Grace that was new to Jesse. After five hours of deliberation, the jury found Jesse Kempson guilty of the murder of Grace Mullane. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 17 years. Maybe it's the American in me, but some of these sentences in other countries just seem too light, especially since this was not Jesse's first act of violence against a young woman. When the details of Jesse's arrest hit the news, another young British woman contacted police to report that Jesse had sexually assaulted her while she was visiting New Zealand about eight months before the murder of Grace. Because people like this have a pattern, Jesse met the tourist on Tinder and after taking her on a date that likely concluded at the Bluestone Room, they went to his apartment where she turned down his advance for sex. So he just raped her because that's what self-entitled pieces of shit do. She was too ashamed to report the assault at the time, but seeing that he had escalated to murder, she knew she had to come forward. Jesse opted for a bench trial where his fate would be decided by a judge instead of a jury, and the judge found him guilty. Jesse, being the entitled piece of shit that he is, yelled at the judge, You have no reason to convict me. You're full of shit, mate. Just a little tip. Even if you think you're innocent, don't hurl insults at the judge right before he sentences you. It's a bad decision, but Jesse seems to be full of those. At yet another trial, Jesse's ex-girlfriend came forward and pressed charges for the physical abuse and admitted to the sexual assault from when they lived together. He was also found guilty in that trial and sentenced to a combined 11 years between the two trials. Jesse filed appeals against his convictions and was denied. Jesse Kempson had a desire for violence that he believed he was entitled to. He forced his desire on young women, and even when it resulted in death, he believed he was entitled to get away with it. He is a monster, and hopefully he gets denied parole for many, many years. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter, or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to the hotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help.
If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.